Welcome, welcome, welcome to you all. And greetings to all Pacific peoples joining us. Talofalava, malo elele, ula vinaka, kia orana. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the, or the tangata whenua of the land that I'm on today. For me, that of Nati Fatua. I would encourage you all to think about whose land that you are on. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and ex extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. So, just going to go back and just for anybody who's just joining, a little bit of um, housekeeping here. The webinar will be recorded and posted on the website. Please keep muted, pop your questions in the chat, and we'll try and get to those towards the end of the session. No tamaki makaura ho, he kaitiaki puka puka, o kete wananga, or aranui, or tamaki makaura, call up man hayes to kuingwa. I am from Auckland or Tamaki Makoto. I'm a scholarly communications librarian here at AUT. My name is Lukman Hayes. My name has an interesting story, but I won't bore you with that today. It doesn't really reflect my origins, which are Russian Jewish from Georgia on my mother's side and English Irish on my father's. Thank you for tuning into what I'm sure was, will be a very engaging discussion about open access and centering indigenous voices and research. Um, so you're encouraged to place your questions in the chat, as, as I said, and we'll, I'll ask those on your behalf at the end. Um, but please also do tweet away if that's your thing. Uh, there are a few OA Week hashtags around, but I can imagine the discussion will inspire a few others. Um, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves shortly, but I will first ask Hemi to open our conversation or our corridor all today with a karakia. Iki tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou i ngā tōpito, tēnā koutou i runga noa te kaupapa nāna nei i tātou e kukuri i whakatahi i tēnē rangi. Koe noa, ka tuku nā karakia hei whakawāti i a tātou nei kōru mo tā rānei. Hoi, i ki whakatahau ti te uru, whakatakatahau ki te tunga, ki a mā kene kene ki uta, ki a mā tāra tāra ki tā. I hia ki ana, te ātā kora, e teo, e huka, e hahu. So if you'd like to just introduce yourself, should we start with, uh, in the list on the screen there, Hinemato. Kia ora tātou, te mea tuatahi, he mihi ki a koe he mi nā ui whakarite tō tātou hui i rungi te āhuatanga kui mā koroma nai rera, kā te mihi, kei te mihi. Uh, ki a koe Lukman me uh, Kirsten, waku rangatira katoa e tai mai ki te whakarongo mai ki a mātou i tēnei wā tēnā rā koutou katoa. Kia ora. Uh, ko Hinamatau taku ingoa, I'm um, Hinamatau McNeil and um, I'm an uri of tapuitika Ngāti Moko uh, te arawa waka. Nā reira, kia ora rawa atu koutou. My name is uh, Siriana Naepi. I'm named after my great grandmother who raised my mother in the village of Lakinda in Neta City, Fiji. Uh, my last name is that of my husband's, whose family are from Avasale and Tamakatonga. So, Fakalofalahiatu, welcome to New England Language Week. Um, thank you to the team for organizing this. It's an amazing opportunity to share and speak with others in the space. Kia ora. Hi everyone, um, my name is Kirsten Thorpe. Um, I'm here on the land of the Gadigal people in Sydney. Um, so I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge my other panelists here today and echo those sentiments that it's so great to be here to have this conversation. Um, my family are Waramai people from Port Stephens in New South Wales, a um, couple of hours north of Sydney. Um, so I acknowledge my family and ancestors as well. Thank you. Uh, Mi waitaha, mi hikau ki rotau i tēnei rā. 
kaurina mihi ki a koutou mi ki ngā kai kōrero ki tēnei wā. Um, koutou nā mi ki ngā pūkenga. Uh, mi o koutou ngai mi ki um, mōhio ki tēnei. Mi ki hi rere kei tēnei kaupapa. Um, hua nō uh, ka tika me mi atu ki a koutou i tēnei wā. Um, good afternoon everyone, I'm Himi Whanga from Te Puawana Ki Te Ao at the University of Waikato. Um, privileged to be here today with um, which I've, a fantastic panel that they've put together and very diverse and I'm looking forward to the portal today. I um, want to acknowledge everyone, everyone from the Pacific to everyone from uh, Iki Ahitreia, nga Miki the, the Whenua Momoya, koutou nga, um, kanui te miki a koutou. Kia ora. I'll stop sharing my screen now so we can just have your faces. Um, <clears throat> and it really, it's, it's your conversation. So what I'll do is just throw out a few talking points and um, get, leave it over to you to, to speak as you wish. Um, so let's open up the discussion by asking each of you or all of you, um, why is open access important to you as Indigenous researchers? Well, I'll start. Um, I think that it's of. I think it's an opportunity for Indigenous people to be able to talk to each other. I think there's incredible potential. I think it's only just um, starting. We're only just beginning to see what potential there is for us to be able to talk to each other because. A lot of, even with the open journals that are indigenous ones that are around, they're very kind of localized. And I'd like to see, I'm hoping that the momentum for um, open access will end up by being a lot more global so that we can actually share our ideas and uh, our work and actually talk to, you know, and um, as a forum for us to be able to engage and communicate. Uh, from an indigenous perspective. So I think that there, I don't, I don't think it's been harnessed yet, but I think that there is incredible potential for open access to really advance uh, indigenous voices in the um, research space. Oh, that's my hewawa tātena, that's my hope. Kia ora, I, I, I agree. I... I, I agree this idea that it provides the opportunity for us to talk across the globe in ways that perhaps isn't like that isn't possible when it's closed and I think from, from my perspective the the reason it's important is because it's, it's a fundamental question about if you're if it's possible to own knowledge right when we put them behind paywalls we're saying it's possible to own knowledge and then when we go a little bit further it's possible for people we've never met in this world to own our people's knowledges. And how is, I, I, it's hard for me to comprehend how we can exist in a system that rewards that, that rewards selling our community's knowledges to people who we've never known for them to then make a profit um, and our people can't access their own knowledge. So I came to this with um, a bit of a critical eye because, you know, I, I thought about open access and thought I am a real advocate of the space and I totally support um, the other panellists um, thinking about the sharing. Um, but I also wonder in terms of the open access mantra, how much the systems and structures continue to privilege um, mainstream and Western ways. Um, so I thought, you know, when this question was sort of posed that I think there are real opportunities. And as an Indigenous researcher, you know, of course, the work that I want, that I do, I want to be disseminated, um, both within the disciplines that I work in. And I especially want the information to be circulated back to communities so that they have that feedback loop and they can use that information 
but I'm also critical of the paradigm that open means open for everyone because some things may not necessarily, um, yeah, they, they don't need to be open. And I guess one of the things that I was thinking about with the panel today was um, particularly around research data. How much do Indigenous communities have to share in that paradigm? as compared to being open for community use only. Um, so I, yeah, I had a bit of a, a critical view around the, the power and the privilege that exists within, particularly I'm, I come from a perspective of being a researcher, but also working in libraries and archives and as an information worker. So I wonder about the structures that exist and um, how they might also be impediments to our work. You started off with a really difficult question there. Um, it depends. I, I agree with all the panelists. There's opportunity in here, but there was also a lot of risk involved for our communities. Um, and to be really honest, when, when we go out as researchers, we, we talk about uh, collecting the, the information and, and the knowledge from our communities and using it for specific parts of research projects. Um, I don't fully believe that our communities are, are fully aware what we mean when we go out there and talk to them and, and it's gathering that knowledge. There needs to be a lot of work on that. We, we do have to do as researchers to really articulate what we're doing with their, with their knowledge. Um, and then when we are, we are, and I think Kirsten brought up a really good point, is when we go from being community and having an academic research role, and then this sort of folding into those knowledge institutes like archives and libraries, there's, you know, we've got a, a long tail, a really bad history with archives and libraries right across these indigenous peoples. Um, and the way that they've collected our knowledge and the way they present our knowledge and our cultures and the way that they um, tell us how to be indigenous. And it, there's quite a, I think, um, there's, there's a big gap in between um, that kind of feeling like as a, as a community member and also be having the awareness as a researcher, the kind of um, barriers in which are already up in place in, in these institutes and also the, the way that we've got to also balance what material we share and also which material do we not share with, mm. um, with, that, you know, with that research community. There's a lot of stuff that I work on that I do not share. I don't think it's my place to share um, that collective knowledge with, um, with institutes and with, um, with that current structure that's in, that's in place. So it's a lot of kind of toing and froing right between, you know, the museums have done us over for a long time um, to where there's a lot of change happening in museums and a lot of goodwill, but goodwill will not change some behaviour that we know is in place. Right through to thinking, okay, we want to provide total open access to what we've got, but this may be the top level of discussion that we've had with our communities and not the in-depth stuff, which needs to remain within those communities to, you know, to ensure that those communities thrive. So it's a really difficult question straight off the bat. I also think that there's a tension, you know, I think that kind of tension that both you and Kirsten are talking about, are what we face no matter what field we're in, whether we're academic and medicine or whatever, that's the realities of what we always have to navigate. Now, I remember Merita Mita, you know, during the Springbok tour. And Merita, we were all um, engaged in various activities um, at that time. But I remember her always talking about where you point the camera. And I think that as academics or in whatever field we're working in, I, I do believe those are things that we navigate and we're also very careful, but I really like the idea of being able to, in fields that I'm doing research in, of connecting with other Indigenous people because it is such a small, there's so few of us. And even if we are, you know, our research probably um, goes into mainstream publications because that's just the way that the, you know, I mean, you only have to think about the work that um, um, Linda Smith did, 
you know, when when she talked about indigenous methodologies, that provides that context, and that is that kind of but our marginalization is our reality. And um, and I think that that tension is something that we, that is, you know, the reality that we have, how much do we give? How much of the, you know, um, tapu stuff do we keep? And then I'm thinking too about some of the um, wakahuya. You watch some of the early wakahuya that, that, that are being translated than the deep stuff, the old Wakahuya uh, documentaries. Well, there's some pretty sacred material in there. And I think that when it's in the real, you uh, got a fair bit of safety in there. But I think, yeah, those are things that we have to, and I think that most of us, all of us in this space are really careful, are very protective of our communities. And um, I think it's just a matter of being vigilant. Yeah, I have to say, I'd never really, when people say open access, I'm like, yeah, open access to publications. Um, I hadn't really thought about it as open access to all of our knowledge. Um, so I'd, I think I'd assumed that filter that you've just spoken about. I'd assumed that we would have the power to filter what we choose to put in there. And that filtering process involves conversations. Um, my fa one of my favorite talks is my aunties said no, right? Because I have gone to my aunties and said, oh, I want to write about this, and they've gone, no. <laughs> okay, <laughs> next thing. Um, and and I, I, yeah, I, I, I think that that's, and it is important to think about what are we giving them access to when we say open access. In my head, I was like, we're just going to drop all the paywalls. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm a, bit, I'm a bit thrown thinking, okay, does that, therefore, if we drop all the paywalls, does that obligate us to share everything? And what is our obligation? And how do we stop that? I mean, one of my great concerns is that a lot of the library management systems and the institutional repositories that look after research data, um, they perpetuate those colonial um, mm. practices and paradigms of othering Indigenous people, and they do that in ways that we have no control over. And until you start to look deeper into the way that they carry information and disseminate that, um, how they give attribution to particular people and in hierarchies, you know, and um, yeah, disseminate information that's either um, transactional or, um, you know, privileges researchers rather than whole groups of people. Um, I think that there are real challenges in that work. And sometimes they're things because they're not visible and they're not in the front line of what's happening. They become something that becomes silenced and, um, and sort of deeper that we can't uncover. So I'm really interested in that research data space of how we start to unpack some of the challenges and open up um, the indigenous voice space in the systems design. And I think, you know, for me, that's an agenda that we need to look to. Yeah, and I, and I also think that um, when when we're applying for funding and, and you end up with con yeah, and the contracting part of that, and it talks a lot about um, your management of your data and, and tracking that, and, and then um, with some publications, they're asking you for all your spreadsheets and all your recordings to be uploaded into a central repository somewhere. And a lot of our institutes don't have that. I've, it started to filter through in, in the last couple of projects that I've got. And I'm going, no, that's not going to happen. And um, I don't have the, and I don't, uh, I don't think I have the right to to say that this collective knowledge um, is mine to put into a university repository, and for the university to run their processes and access and attributions over that material. So there's quite a lot of movement happening within the Aotearoa kind of research. Um, area around data management, around who can get access to some of that data and what does it mean for us as Indigenous researchers. Um, and, um, and then how does that push up into those, you know, those archives and into metadata and, and how do you source that material and, um, 
and who's allowed to source that material and then how do you attribute the actual knowledge holders and all that kind of very long-winded discussion. Because um, we know in our community who are the knowledge holders and we like to attribute them, but a lot of people outside those communities do not know these people and, and who their importance and the knowledge that they do hold. A lot of it is place-based, very specific to that area, but also very... Um, has a broad kind of reach into a lot of things we're doing as a as a collective and so it's important to share but under what conditions and those conditions are moving at the moment and are being you know like yeah you know, when you're when you're you've written something and spent that long working with a community and it's a great piece of work and then people are saying oh well to make that open access you've got to pay two thousand to five thousand dollars and we never factored that type of money into publishing I'd rather factor five thousand dollars and getting an intern or a student a scholarship, as opposed to creating a barrier to share stuff that you've gone through. You believe the right processes and, and creating an open and honest discussion about the knowledge, and then getting stonewalled again because someone overseas wants to put it into a repository, an online repository, and you're not printing. So what does it cost that much? It's interesting. I think that's right. I, I really appreciate the my journal model, right? But somebody somewhere is paying for my <laughs> to exist. Um, but it, it's, it means a lot with my has been my preference for publishing because I know that it's open access. Anyone like all of my community can access it. There's no cost for us to put in. But I, I think it comes out of NAPI's funding. Yeah, I might be wrong. Okay. Yeah. Um, and how do we convince universities that they should be funding this and that they should be enabling us to set up more open access so that we can share knowledge that doesn't have to be uploaded to a complete stranger that our communities can access and it gives us some level of control over what um what over what's being stored and how it's being stored because what i love about my is we can go down the road knock on the door of the editors and go hey <laughs> what are you up to um, and that's probably putting a lot of pressure on them um, in terms of how many of us want to publish with them but how do we convince the universities to invest in more journals like that? Well, so it sounds, <clears throat> what I'm hearing is there's a couple of really, really key and really important points. And that's one is around sovereignty of, of knowledge and ownership and, but also around the systems that we use for um, not only storing, but disseminating knowledge and information, let alone academic publishing. And that perhaps what we should be thinking about, um, yes, as somebody's commented in the chat, institutional repositories are free, but they're also part of an existing institution. They're part of the, the Western academ academic institution, as it were. So should we be thinking about how we design systems so that they are uh, more intuitive, more sensitive to indigenous ways of thinking and ways of handling stories and data. Well, I think you've got to go back a step as well. What um what I I think it's been it's difficult for us as indigenous um scholars, academics, to get the um academy to actually even value. Because on the one side we've got that sovereignty issue, but on the other side, there's also where I've felt in a long careers in academic that our thinking and our ways of thinking and doing if you like are not as valued and um, very recently I've been doing research with um, in design and creative technologies with well-being so some of you might know him and um, what's been really interesting about practice-led research it's a kind of a new way that really appears appears or does seem to acknowledge and really value indigenous or our ways of thinking and um, I'm not convinced that um, that academic institutions or the academy if you like really does value indigenous thought and I think that that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of a bit excited about the idea of open access going further, because even with um, 
my and you know some of the the, the indigenous publishers that are um, kind of opening up for um, indigenous um, right um, researchers. I'd like a further in my in the research that I've been doing recently be really um, wonderful to have a, a system or a, a vehicle to reach other indigenous peoples to talk about some of the um, in the fields that, that we're working in, you know, to find out what what we can share and and I think for that's that's what I felt has been really missing, like trying to dig through um, journals and other, you know, and you know, conventional um, publications to try and dig out information that's truly indigenous is no mean feat. But I'd like to see a really kind of much more global, I don't know how, I mean, but really like to see a real global reach where we can really, you know, we're in, for me, um, previously colonised or colonised people to be able to, um, you know, work together collaboratively would be very exciting. And I just saw open access as being perhaps a way of doing that. But listening to Kirsten, who knows the systems, maybe not. <laughs> there are ways. <laughs> I think it's so important to imagine the alternative. And that's probably, you know, when I was thinking about that critical view is, I think that's where we need to invest time and across, you know, in it from an Australian perspective, across, you know, multiple Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations and then getting together um, you know, internationally to say, well, what is that other way of knowing and how do we map that into something that works for us? Um, and, and that imagining, I think it requires people to let go of power and people who, you know, sit in the e-research spaces or people who work um, in university libraries to actually start to hear us and start to hear where some of the, the systems really fall down. Um, and it's kind of been my observation that people will suggest the things that the system can do to support Indigenous knowledges, but it's not built from the ground up in the way that you've just described. And I think that's where we have to fundamentally get back to a grassroots level and talk about, you know, the need for us not to be extracting knowledge from communities anymore, to make sure that if, you know, communities are informing research that they have their data repositories that we support in communities. You know, it's always going back to this idea that, you know, Australia at the University of Technology, Sydney, you know, but what about the communities that give their knowledge? How are we supporting them to care for materials? So I'm so keen to do the imagining and I think that, the open access paradigm could work for us, but we have to, we have to be um, be thinking about those power structures that need to be, um, you know, I guess it's a, you know, for me, some people need to step out of the way and let those community conversations take place. But there's another issue too, like for communities, like for the, for those of us who very active in our communities. The thing is, is that we're part of the problem too, because our language is the language of academia. All of all of us indigenous academics have all been trained, you know, even though we're, we're critically, critical and quite rightly so. But the fact is it's that there is also a chasm sometimes between us and our people, like for, um, even to translate the language that we write in. And, um, you know, a lot of the time when we're feeding back now, like um, um, the, the project that I'm looking at now is we're wanting to create a documentary with them in it, you know, as, as the major output now. And that they can, um, that they can relate to, but if I write for, an, quite frankly, if I write for a journal, I mean, they're not going to get past the, the abstract. They're going to want to throw it into the whare paku. You know, they're not, um, that's, so we kind of live in a schizophrenic existence of, you know, of writing for the, giving to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and then giving to our people what we 
you know, the, the real stuff, if you like. Yeah. But I think we have to look at ourselves too. Now, I came from a workshop today on Taranoa and one of the students was like, you know, how do we, how do we convince the university to, to be okay with this? And I said, unfortunately, we're still doing the double work. We're still writing for the university and the academy and then we're producing knowledge in that is, it's the same knowledge presented in a different way for our communities and our universities fundamentally do not reward what is important to our communities. We're still being asked to do that double work. And so even with, the, even with open access journals, the universities don't value them. Um, you know, they, if it's particularly if it's a domestic publication, they cross it off the list. They will literally cross it off when it comes to promotion applications, let alone if I was like, oh, we put together a really easily accessible two pager on the research and it got downloaded 2000 times, the community care about it. That, no, <laughs> that doesn't move us up the rankings, let's cross it off. And so we need to talk about that, that fundamental, and, and it's the same um, that you were talking about, Kristen, is, is we're still trying to do it within the structure. We're still trying to store this knowledge and we're still trying to store this information within our current structures. And, and we, we cannot do it differently while we're still within and trying to imagine it within. We have to imagine it outside. And that's an almost impossible feat. <laughs> <laughs> because we're so ingrained and we're trained here. We're trained to publish in these ways. We're trained and you have to start untraining ourselves and untraining others um, all while teaching and doing research. And <laughs> yeah, but you see the thing, I believe that that's also the, the misconception that what we give back to our communities is not quality. And we can actually, just because it's not written in academic language, in a lot of ways, if, if you've got beautiful images and the way you present it, according to us, it's a much higher quality than the, the journal that we just kind of feel sometimes that we're just talking to other academics. But, you know, like, so I think that that comes back also to that whole um, Europe, you know, uh, marginalisation of, of Indigenous voices of how they of what we deem to be quality and how, how we measure it compared to how um the academy what the academy sees as you know quality research and what we're doing i'll shut up now you look as though you were about to speak Amy, but i can my brain's ticking out. I was reading some of the chat comments and um, there's a few that talk about, there's one that talks about engagement and impact agenda. I think that's really important in creating that kind of conversation around um, open access and what that actually means. So I had a conversation recently which talked about, and it talks to, I think you got a question up here that talks about um, career development and and in career development, it talks to the, the wider impact and the international impact and what that kind of looks like for, for us as scholars, you know. Um, and then um, that conversation went to, okay, so what we do in terms of our um, impact is for our communities and our communities are where we come from. And if that influences um, and engages the international um, community as well, that is very much a, 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 an additional benefit. And then in the, in the Institute, um, getting recognition of, say, for example, um, Mātauranga Māori or Indigenous knowledge within the Institute, where it's very much facing inward to our communities and we see the impact of our work in the community, it's really hard to measure in terms of, um, you know, those statistics that have really you know, impact statistics and journals and stuff like that. If you can see it, a uh, change of behaviour or uh, a change in policy or a change somewhere that um, directly uh, benefits our community as a researcher, and this conversation went on like this for quite a while, and, and we're going, so it's very difficult to, to, to have this measure around impact, which is very much a Western-facing measure. And then for us, we'll see impact in a very different way and it's a different measure completely. 
and then trying to just sort of balance that or balance, get that balance on how to communicate that within an institution and communi communicate that um, by what we actually see in, in, in terms of how our knowledge is looked after. Um, and there's other kind of comments that talk too. Um, one of them said, um, which kind of links into this one, you know, like the university um, repositories are open access and free, but that's the stuff that we choose as academics to place in there. And there's this big backlog of stuff that we know that doesn't make it into these university repositories because our communities also have relationships with the universities, which are not so good as well. Um, so, you know, the, you know, when they say that they, these things are difficult to measure, they are really difficult to measure. And whose benefit is, is, is this work are we doing it for? I think um, Kirsten's got a really good uh, um, kind of overview on it. says, well, well, I know I do my work for my community. At the end of the day, if it doesn't benefit my community, and these are the students that come from our communities, these are our elders that come from the communities, and this is also the knowledge that comes from our community. If you're not doing work for them, then we should be in another profession. End of, end of, end of the day. Um, and what that looks like can be visually, can be through song. Now, if it was written in our language, in Māori or in whatever indigenous language, we don't have any of these issues. Only those who can understand it would be able to deconstruct the meaning in it. And then so we stuck with this really interesting dilemma, which our languages are under threat, our cultures are under threat. And also, if I write this uh, a piece of Māori, I've only got one or two places that I can place it within a journal that I know someone can also review it and critique it for the piece it is. So we've got this, and I can write it in English and it can go to multiple people to review. So you've got this really crazy kind of dynamic happening. It's been happening for a long time. Stop talking now. Did anyone want to add anything to that? Otherwise, this has been fascinating. You've actually, we've actually gone over like three or four of the talking points that I had, I had noted down anyway, just naturally, that's the way the conversation has gone. And what you're describing <clears throat> really sums up the sort of competitive nature of academia and the way in which it marginalizes people, particularly people of color and indigenous people. Um, <clears throat> and, and that's the way in which the publishing industry is run for academics as well. It's, it's run on, on competitive lines and it seems to me that what you're describing in terms of giving back and sharing with communities and having conversation with community in terms of knowledge is all about collaboration and collaboration and competition don't really sit very well together. So we have, we move from here, I suppose, to the sort of what do we do and what can be done uh, sort of questions in order to decolonize in order to change these structures in order to create new ones did you want to offer any thoughts on that no one <laughs> <laughs> i think it's, it's it's like it's system wide though right so we we know we're in institutions and in neoliberal institutions where we have to have an input output measurement and because of this input output measurement our universities are buying into the scholarly ranking systems because that's an output. They're buying into the idea of, um, like I've said, I said in a meeting last week where someone was like, oh, but citations are a non-biased way of measuring whether or not you've been successful. No, they're not. <laughs> and, but it's an easy measurement for them. And so we're, we're stuck in this, this where we have to fundamentally change how universities operate. And that's not easy, especially in our current climate. Um, Australian colleagues, feeling for you, it's not looking great right now if you're in the humanities or social sciences. Um, it's probably heading this way as well. And how do we, they're, they're, our universities in response to crisis are further entrenching them, their ideas and in input output measurables instead of turning the other way. And we need to try and work out how to turn these institutions the other way, um, because it, it, it will help us to address these questions we're trying to come up with, like how do we change how we value knowledge? How do we change how we store knowledge? How do we change how communities access knowledge? It all comes down to how universities understand knowledge. And right now they understand it as input, output, input, output. 
I give you five grand, you give me two publications in a rank, in a rank journal. And, and that's, we, we can't do it overnight. <laughs> I was thinking in response to this, and I just saw in the chat, someone said, I think it starts with listening. And, um, you know, to me, that's an, such an important sentiment because, you know, that the open access movement might be, you know, newish, but the issues that we're talking about are long term and people have been tackling them for generations. So the two things that kind of... Um, really resonate with me is one around relationships and relationships means listening and engaging and being challenged and having dialogue and thinking about your position in the relationship. Um, and the other thing that I think about is leadership. And, you know, when we were looking at this question about change, I was thinking about how fortunate I am at UTS at the moment um, because there's a, a university-wide agenda around Indigenous excellence and although things can always change with whoever is the Vice-Chancellor, I really um, want to acknowledge all of those people that have been in the boardrooms who have been doing this stuff for, you know, the last 20 years to give people like me opportunities or my colleagues to... Um, really chip away at these issues. So I think they're two things that are really important to me that, you know, we have to have that listening and we have to understand that there's a big leadership piece in this that um, exists and has existed for a long time. So we can't forget that other work that's been done. It might not be called open access. It might not be called, um, you know, or sit in the paradigm of technology, but um, I think the issues, you know, have remained and, and we can't see them as new things that have just popped up. So the solutions can't be these quick fixes. We have to look back at our history. And I, for me, in the, you know, sitting in the space of GLAM and libraries and archives, if we only can look back at the failings that have happened in those spaces and learn from them, I think we're going to be in a lot better position. So my two cents worth, um, I think as Indigenous peoples, we, we need to build our own repositories um, and cloud storage um, based on our values and principles and, and law. Um, and then from there, um, we can share in terms of our own, um, of the way we want to share with, with whom. Um, and also um, wanting to um, which means that we can, we can, well, so the bigger picture is that we can store our knowledge the way we want to store it, we can share it the way we want to share it, and it's under our terms and our principles. Um, and we can share it open access, we can share it with restrictions, and, and we can share it with our own and others who, who are also um, deemed as um, collaborators that we can trust. And at the moment, there's a, in this country, I know that there is a lot of conversation about building our own cloud storage that will sit under the, our terms of, of the, the laws of this, of this land. Um, as well, um, that it be owned and developed by Tangata Whenua, and, which means that we can, we can, we can see ourselves um, having some sort of, um, you know, way to dictate in the terms that we would like for the future, for our, for our future generation. So there's a lot happening at, at the moment. So these are issues around IP, collective ownership, copyright, um, the, the rights of imaging, our rights around what um, artifacts can be put in there and how they can be, be used and shared. All those things, if, if we don't have our own, then it's really difficult to negotiate when someone else is telling you these are our laws. These are our um, terms of engagement. Um, and I think that's one of the things in terms of this open access if, is if we're working with someone else's infrastructure and always their terms and, and having to, to, to look through all the terms and restrictions in their repositories and, and how that works for a university and, and, and companies that are, are owned overseas. And so I know in New Zealand we're working towards that as a as a solution to allow our tribes and our iwi to have a place where they can trust and have trust in the way that this, our knowledge is being looked after. 
and who are the people responsible for that. So all these things that needs to be a different level and it starts at grassroots. Um, how much it costs, we have no idea, but we need to build one. Kia ora. I'm really conscious of time. It's coming up to 10.2. Um, <clears throat> there was a question early on, which I'll go back to, um, which was about uh, how would you influence not only academic publishing uh, and academia, but funding bodies overall. Um, but I would sort of maybe also add to that question, uh, what can Pākehā do? What can, you know, why can't white uh, leaders in academia, uh, um, Europeans and so on, do to to aid those that aid that process and to to add their own influence to bring about the change that you're all talking about. Nobody. Well, I've been working collaboratively on a recent research um, project with um, ecologists that have. Um, and I think that what Hemi referred to was that whole trust issue. And I think that for a lot of, uh, you know, indigenous, whatever field we're in, I think that it's building up those relationships so that you do feel that, um, that there is a trust thing. Like the, the ecologist that I'm working with at the moment was really clear. It's an MBIE um, project that we're doing that it was going to be led by Māori. Unfortunately, we've got most of the work to do. So. But um, there's certainly, you know, like, but I think that um, it is, for, well, for me anyway, it's about uh, working with non-Māori who um, are committed to the kaupapa and to our agenda and who that we feel that uh, safe working with that really are genuinely supportive. And um, yeah, so that's just the yeah, experience that I have. And I actually quite like working in collaboration. I like working with people who are uh, expertise in fields that we're not in, in the area that I'm working in. It's, um, it's, it's really great having that, that expertise. Yeah. But the trust for us, the, well for me, the trust issue is huge. Mm -hmm. Well, I think they can do a lot. Um, what I would like to see is, is more leadership from our communities um, and what that looks like and, and trying to envision what our, what our future looks like. Um, you know, they have expertise. Um, they have um, a lot of things to bring and assist with what we're doing. But at the end of the day, it's up to us to do it. Um, and there are some world leaders in terms of technology. I'd like to see um, that there be some succession planning where that knowledge is shared with indigenous communities so they can own and develop and create the way that we see through our own eyes. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult to retrain um, non Māori, for example, around how to see worldview, um, how to see... Um, certain access a cultural understanding but it doesn't mean that we can't they can't be um, collaborators that can assist us in our journey same with us assisting them with their own journey and their cultural um, awareness it's really difficult to say this is a b c you need these qualities different people bring different qualities to the same issue and it's good to see i think it'll be good to see from multiple perspectives the same issue because it informs how to build what this, the future might look like. It's not like a, a list of you have to have these attributes to be a good collaborator. There are different types for different purposes. Uh, for me, I, I just, just support us in structural change. Maureen put in there um, about how you know, um, Kristen, was, Kristen was talking about leadership and change in leadership. Uh, we can't have systems that rely on an individual and unfortunately, we have so few um, Indigenous academics in our institutions, it's relying on individuals. And so as I guess in terms of allyship or whatever you would like to call it, 
it's, it's about attacking those structural systems so that it's not reliant on an individual. Um, it's about calling leadership to account, embedding it in the system so that the changes that we're saying we'd like to see aren't reliant on our people's backs. They're not reliant on individuals. Um, and that's the hard work. Um, one of my mentors called it a silent victory. There will be a lot of silent victories in this movement. And, and sometimes you just can't shout from the rooftops, I did that. <laughs> Daughter. And for me, I'm going to say one thing that I think could bring immediate change in Australia in particular is um, if every single university library in Australia committed to um, an Indigenous agenda, um, we have what I would consider quite appalling um, priority areas in Australia around support for Indigenous research. I'm currently working on a project with the Australian, um, supported by the Australian Library and Information Association through their research award to even get a baseline of how many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander librarians work or, or workers are in libraries. So, you know, um, to get that baseline is gonna be really interesting because I think we've just dropped the ball um, in terms of creating vibrant careers um, and opportunities for people to be in these, facilitation roles between um, academic research and communities. So I think it needs that strategy. And, and I always talk about the idea of radically realigning resources. So I think this means that some things have to go so that we put some focus into this area because it does need resourcing. There's some really excellent questions in the chat and I'm afraid we're not gonna get through all of them, but <clears throat> I do wanna um, read this one out from um, Penny. Uh, what does Indigenous IP look like in a copyright closed access system? I always like to think of it as a value add. Indigenous systems are hugely valuable to solve modern day issues. How do we surface this in a way that is received with the same anticipation? That's a question that's obviously silenced everybody. <laughs> I, I, I think it's going to look different at every community. It's really hard to say what does Indigenous intellectual property look like because it looks different to each of our communities and each of our, and that's why it's such a complicated issue is that we're not able to be like, here it is, we've solved it. Um, we all have to go back to our communities, talk to them about what intellectual property even means. Then what does that look like under a closed system? How do we, how do we enact that? Um, it's such a, you know, and, and it, I think it, it's a little bit of what Hemi was talking about. First of all, it looks like a system that, that we own um, or that's, that's owned and created so that we're able to make those decisions and that if we have to tweak it a little bit, we can. So that my auntie can come and say, that's not working, change it. And we don't have to go through this whole process or talk to someone else and ask if they can change it. Um, but it, it really is going to, it's, it's, it's uh, the reason we're all silent, I think, is we, we kind of go, okay, this is what it looks like for me. But does that translate? Can I, can I take that somewhere else and it still work? Sure. So that, like the comment about IP policies, for example, I think there was a comment in the chat. It just seems almost unwieldy from what you're describing. Well, I think for our communities, intellect is, is a community intellect. And, and individuals in there can thrive and, and create their own individual intellect, but the IP kind of, and copyright is based on an individual ownership. And then when you talk about ownership, it's a collective ownership. So mm -hmm. it's a very different starting point when it is very much a closed system that recognizes the individual within a community system that recognizes the, the wealth of the community. And so your starting point stand, it starts very different and then trying to claim ownership over something and ownership's a really mucky word for us as indigenous people mm. i mean a mucky word is you know, you you build on what's already there and you you that's how we work and claiming ownership on something that has been intergenerationally passed from one family to another family to community within all that and trying to claim ownership over that that's that's dangerous place mm. that's a dangerous place to exist and then trying to make commercial benefit from that 
that's a very different ethic. And I think that's the, 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 the kind of, when we talk about open access, we're talking about an ethic and a way to behave and a moral and a value. And the starting line is very different for an indigenous community and for indigenous scholars than it is for, for non-indigenous. And you know, like this 100 meter race and they've got, they're at the 80 meter mark and we're still trying to discuss when the gun starts for us kind of stuff. Um, doesn't mean that we won't win the race. It's just, it means it's a different starting position in terms of what we have to consider around that thing when we talk about copyright, IP, data, and even the word data is very different. What we mean by data is not the same data as the data that um, others have to consider. Um, yeah, it's just a different discussion. And, and the discussion is happening now and hasn't been happening for a long time. Um, and, and Kirsten's got the really good point, and I think in Siriana as well, and, and for two here, it's just like, we need to have that discussion with our own institutes, with Crown agencies, and with, um, you know, those knowledge repositories that we've had ongoing discussions with for a long time, but they're not changing the way they behave. It's a long game for us. Kia ora. Um, if anybody would like to make any sort of final comments, um, we've actually just gone over time slightly, but um, I'll just open it up for those final comments if you want to say anything. Otherwise, uh, everything in the chat, um, thank you for all of the questions and all of the amazing comments. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them, but hopefully we can capture that and, um, and do something with it. We can um, keep the discussion going. I think there was a comment there somewhere, someone was asking, how can we keep this going somehow? Uh, well, Seliana and I did have a little chat about that the other day. <laughs> um, and hopefully, yes, we can. Um, uh, but certainly uh, it's been fascinating and really enjoyable being a part of this. And thank you all for, for your time and your generosity. Um, and can I ask Kemi if you could please close the discussion with your karakia? So I'd like to thank the other panelists. It's really weird doing this online. Too. Like, I think we managed it quite well. There's a, there's a few silent pauses and that was like and it's really hard to go like that and you talk or someone else because someone's on that side and someone's on that side um and also i'd like to thank the other participants i think there was like 170 in here yeah. um on eight different screens and and what's kind of upsetting for me is all i can see is their names and not their, their pictures as well um so i'd like to thank them for participating in, in our in our quarter today and also, um, I'd like to thank um, the organisers um, for putting this on. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of these panels in the past, and I think it's something that they should do more often. Um, and then bring different people, maybe community as well, into these conversations who have worked with academic, who with them. I think it's been a wonderful conversation. And um, wishing everyone across the globe the best of health and stay well and stay safe. I promise I won't send my unwell cousins your way to Australia um, as well. So um, I'd like to thank everyone. I'd like to thank um, um, the, the week, the, what the, all the different activities that uh, that's been organised across the week. So I'm going to drop into a few of those as well. So um, I'll close us. So something simple like... Um, Thank you. Kia ora. Kia ora everybody. Noho mai.